Okay. Our speaker tonight is Aaron Morrison, who is one of us. The Blue Wall is raised for Mexican and Civil War and maybe more. Uh, it was a Zoab unit. They had flashy Eastern style uniforms until they proved too impractical and then they <laughs> toned it down a whole bunch. Uh, they were light infantry, which meant they rode their horses to the battle, tied up the horses, and fought on foot, unlike cavalry. Um, and they were part of Montgomery County for quite some time. And now I'll wait for it. Montgomery <laughs> <laughs> County grew up here. Side of Crawfordsville, uh, left for time, uh, came back in 2000. So I've been back a little bit, and uh, I've always been passionate about uh, history uh, since the beginning. So uh, history was my first love. Uh, it was the first thing I really grabbed onto as a kid, and so um, I have followed that thread for a long time. Uh, and that has also led me to um, interests in uh, the Civil War, uh, most especially when I was when I was a kid and getting into family genealogy, learned about my relatives that were involved in the American Civil War, and so I felt a bit of personal connection to it, um, which leads me to my interest in the Montgomery Guards. So uh, I don't think I don't think it's going to let me do a full picture, so I'm just going to keep moving forward like this. Hopefully you all can at least somewhat see my, my picture. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about um, the origin and composition of the Montgomery Guards, a little bit of the experiences of the soldiers uh, that were involved, uh, Lou Wallace's role. I'm going to briefly touch on the service history of the 11th Indiana, which is what uh, the guards uh, eventually became mustered into, uh, and then I'll also talk a little bit about the legacy of the 11th Indiana and the Montgomery Guards. Um, but starting again with just my connection to the Montgomery Guards, um, I have relatives on both sides of the war. Um, on the Union side, my great 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 grandfather, um, a guy by the name of uh, George Canada of Advance, uh, Indiana at first, and then later Jamestown. Um, there's this great marker, it's an old Union Cemetery in Jamestown. Um, but he was a part of the 135th Indiana um, in, uh, for most of 1864, and then later mustered out, and then came into the 11th Indiana, uh, which is what Lou Wallace's regiment was and the Montgomery Guards became a part of. And so uh, he didn't actually see that much action. He spent the war just guarding ra railroads, essentially, which I guess worked out because I'm here. Uh, he, he didn't die, so I guess it's good that he didn't see see that much action. Um, but yeah, my, my grandpa, uh, Morrison, used to tell some stories about when he was a kid uh, interacting with, uh, uh, interacting with them. He, uh, he used to talk about how on uh, uh, Memorial Day um, he would get up in front of the church and he would be in his Civil War uniform and everything. He was very prominent in the Grand Army of the Republic, which for um, Union Civil War veterans, that was their fraternal organization after the war. So, um, so yeah, he can, that's just one of the memories that, that he passed on. Um, and so uh, I'll tell a little bit more about his involvement in the GAR a little bit later. But yeah, that's my connection to the Montgomery Guards, kind of indirectly. Um, who were the Montgomery Guards? The Montgomery Guards were a volunteer militia group, first organized by Lou Wallace in April of 1856 and lasting until late uh, 1860 when they were then later incorporated into the 11th uh, Indiana. Um, many in this group would go on to become officers and soldiers um, in the 11th Indiana during the American Civil War. And so I have a few pictures that I've, I've uh, brought into this PowerPoint. 
This one is just of a militia unit around the late uh, 1850s, so it's not in Montgomery Guards, but it kind of gives you an example of what they may have looked like, at least early, early on in their incarnation. Um, Lou Wallace obviously played a huge role in the Montgomery Guards and its creation and its composition. Um, so Lou Wallace, at this point in his life, he, he had moved back to uh, Crawfordsville in 1853 from Covington, Indiana. He, he kind of moved back and forth uh, during the early years between Covington and Crawfordsville and uh, also sometime in Indianapolis when uh, his father, David Wallace, was the governor. Uh, but at this point, he's about uh, 27 years old uh, when he moves back to Crawfordsville uh, to become a lawyer. Uh, in some sense, he resigns from being uh, the prosecutor in Covington, Indiana, and comes back here for private practice. Uh, and that's when him and his wife, Susan, had uh, started building their, their home uh, in what was originally the Elston Grove um, way back when. Um, by uh, the mid-1850s, uh, Lou Wallace uh, had served in the Mexican-American War. He uh, had been a lieutenant in the 1st Indiana Infantry uh, during the Mexican-American War. Um, and he, had, he was also married to Susan Elston, the daughter of Isaac Elston, the, the prominent banker um, here in town. And was also the, the brother-in-law of Henry S. Lane. Um, uh, he had his first son, Henry, by 1853 at that point. So young, married, ambitious. Um, at this point in his life, he, you know, he, had, he had a father who was a governor, and uh, Lou Wallace was, he, he wanted to do something with his life. He wanted to, he wanted to make, make his name. And so um, from what I, I had read ahead of time um, in biographies of Lou Wallace, he wasn't all that terribly passionate about being a lawyer. <laughs> Um, but he was passionate about politics and about war. Um, so, um, so the origins of the Montgomery Guards. So back in 1855, uh, the country was um, highly contentious over the issue of slavery. Um, and in uh, the fall of 1855, uh, an incident known as Bloody Kansas happened. So Bloody Kansas, for context, um, happened as a result of, again, tensions over the issue of slavery. Um, how states, as states were coming into the Union, there was this concern about um, the balance of power in Washington, D.C., shifting um, one, way or, one way or the other. So who was going to have power uh, in the U.S. government? Was it going to be the slave states or was it going to be the free states? And so um, Kansas was territory at that time still, and lots of people from both uh, free states and slave-owning states were trying to both move into Kansas to see who could uh, make the states either into a slave state or a free state. So this created uh, the tension and the conflict known as Bloody Kansas, which involved um, John Brown. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the story later that happened with Harper's Ferry and um, uh, John Brown's body lies in Mulder in the grave, which was one of the popular songs of the time. But yeah, he, John Brown was one of the instigators um, there of Bloody Kansas. And so um, that was happening. Lou Wallace was hearing about this happening um, just as everybody else was at that time. Um, and so there was a sense in the air that war was coming. Didn't know when, but that it was coming. And so there was a desire to be ready to fight. Um, the U.S. did not have a huge standing army uh, at, this, at this point, not like, we, not, like, not like we do now. So there was a need, there was a sense of needing to have uh, militia units to um, in the, in the possibility of war. Um, Wallace received his commission from the governor um, to start organizing the Montgomery Guards in April of 1856. And so he got his commission uh, from governor in Indianapolis and came back here to the county and probably started plastering signs up around being like, hey, come join my unit. Um, 
And so that was the beginnings. Um, in total, there was 65 local men uh, who were a part of the Montgomery Guards. Um, they ranged from clerks, mechanics, farm boys, and Wabash College students. So there's a wide range of um, men uh, from different walks of life represented in the Montgomery Guards. Uh, the states provided arms and equipment, but the unit collectively had to provide their own tents, uh, uniforms, and bands uh, at first. And so um, they drilled two to three nights per week, and they used a book called Hardy's Infantry Tactics as a guide. So that was, that was their, their guidebook for, for their various drills um, as, they, as they went about. And so, um, a little bit later, uh, they became uh, zoops. So zoops, in brief, were a form of uh, they, they, they were they started originated in France as kind of a colorful um, elite infantry unit. Um, and so Wallace had read about French soldiers in a magazine, um, and he was very impressed. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Wallace was a man who wanted to do something with himself. He was ambitious. He wanted to make an impression. And so he wanted this group uh, of guys in rural Montgomery County to, to, to gain some, some status, get, get, some, uh, um, get some recognition. And so um, the colorful uniforms and drills to Wallace's sense of the theatrical. And you can see in the, the picture that I have there, um, the uniforms consisted of kepis, so kepis was the hat, um, with red cloth, red and blue Greek tunics, these baggy gray breeches, and then gaiters. Um, so, so yeah, very, very flamboyant, very colorful, very eye-catching kind of, kind of attire. Um, I'd like to think in some ways, uh, um, you know, the, the, the imagery of the zoobs may in some ways that have inspired, um, you know, Wallace's imagination with Ben-Hur maybe late, later, just that sense of, of the theatrical. So, uh, as they became zoobs, and as these, these young men were training, um, there were some locals here who thought that it was all a, quote, wicked waste of time and money uh, to be doing this. And so I, I was reading in one account that there were actually a couple attempts um, by people to disrupt the proceedings. So like a couple, uh, couple of uh, people who just um, thought it was a waste of time would uh, try, to, try to be a distraction. It, it wasn't elaborated to what extent, but... Uh, they, that did happen, um, but other people were impressed. And so, uh, this is a report from the Crawfordsville Review, the newspaper at the time, uh, at a grand encampment of um, statewide militia units that met in Lafayette uh, on July the 4th of 1859. And so, Crawfordsville Review, Review says, discarding all Fancy maneuvering, they went through the drill of the regular service like veterans. They looked as if they could stand like a wall of iron, or bayonet in hand, make a gallant dash at the enemy's line. One other thing about zoops that uh, was notable compared to other military units was um, their ability to uh, respond to uh, bugle sounds rather than shouted commands. Um, and so if you think about that in, in a battle situation, that could be a, an advantage. You know, you got the, the sounds of battle going on overhead. Might be a little bit easier to hear a bugle through the sounds of battle than somebody's shouting voice. And so they had to memorize uh, all different manner of signals uh, from, from a bugle. Um, in order to do their maneuver. So in that way, they were, they were kind of considered a little bit different than other, other military units as well. Um, this was uh, another uh, description in an article by the Crawfordsville Review. 
Um, the Montgomery Guards at Crawfordsville, under the command of Captain Lou Wallace, is said to be now the best military company in the state. It will be recollected that the company at the time, it was here during the military encampment last July, was considered one of the best drilled and best uniformed of those present. Since that time, they have been much improved in military tactics and can, as we are told, execute 630 evolutions by the tap of the drum. We have no doubt but that the company will always maintain its high position so long as it keeps Captain Wallace at its head. Crawford's will review in January of 1860. Uh, in addition to these grand encampments, they were also featured at the county fair and local Masonic order ceremonies, and so they were going to be a part of those things. Uh, the high point, uh, allegedly, was for, for the for the unit was a performance in Indianapolis that was performed uh, during Washington George Washington's birthday in 1860. And uh, Susan Wallace, Lou Wallace's wife, composed a song for the Montgomery Guards uh, for, for the occasion. I tried finding, see if I could find like the lyrics to the song for the Montgomery Guards. I couldn't find anything. Surely there's, it's buried somewhere in, 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 a, in an archive here locally, but I, I'd, I'd be very curious to find lyrics to that song for the Montgomery Guards. Um, but yeah, you get the sense that yeah, they were they they had transformed themselves from you know just a ragtag group of uh, guys in in rural Crawfordsville to something more than more than that, but something that was respected statewide um, at the time. So the war begins with firing on Fort Sumter on April twelfth, eighteen sixty one. Lou Wallace brings his unit um, to Indianapolis. Uh, they're mustered into service, uh, becoming the 11th Indiana. Uh, Lou Wallace was actually, at the time, the ad adjutant general. So Governor Morton, governor of in Indiana, had charged Lou Wallace with kind of organizing the first big bunch of soldiers uh, that were to come from Indiana. So they're all gathering in Indianapolis. Um, so these next few slides, I'm just going to go through a very, very brief service history, kind of capturing the highlights of what the unit was involved with during, during the war. Um, they were involved at the battles of uh, Fort Henry and Donaldson in February uh, 2nd, uh, 2nd through 6th in 1862. They were also at the Battle of Shiloh, which was one of the first major battles um, in the Western theater of the war. Uh, they were later at the Battle of Fort Gibson, Champions Hill, and also at the Siege of Vicksburg, which um, if you forget every other battle that happens during the American Civil War, remember Gettysburg and Vicksburg. Both of those battles were kind of the, the decisive um, battles uh, in the eyes of, of of many historians uh, for, for the Civil War. And so uh, Vicksburg was the key hub on the Mississippi that secured um, the Mississippi River for the Union and kind of divided the Confederacy in two at that point. And so the 11th Indiana was present at the Siege of Vicksburg. Um, later on in the war, they were actually transferred to the Eastern Theater, transferred to Washington, D.C where they participated in Philip Sheridan's uh, Shenandoah Valley campaign. Uh, they were present at the Battle of Winchester, Fishers Hill, and uh, the Battle of Cedar Creek, all of which took place in the Shenandoah Valley uh, area of uh, Northern Virginia. And then, um, for the last remaining part of the war, and this is actually where my great-great-great-grandfather gets involved, uh, he, they, uh, they were um, sent to Fort Marshall in Baltimore, Maryland uh, from January 7th to July 26th, and then mustered out on July 26th, 1865. In total during the war, they lost one officer, uh, 114 enlisted men, um, three officers, and 170 enlisted men by disease. Um, so in total, they lost about 288 um, of, of the units. So. Um, yeah, considering how other regiments fare, they actually 
did fairly well <laughs> for themselves. Yes? What was their initial size? Um, I can't remember what their, what their initial size, but one thing to know about um, union units is that uh, they would typically not replenish their their units. They would choose to um, they would choose to make whole new units rather than replenish current ones. So let's say, for example, um, there was a thousand um, thousand men that started with the 11th at Vienna. Um, more often than not, as casualties mounted, those units would not be replenished. They just kind of let them let them go, and then um, they would they would bring in new guys um, for a whole new unit. So, um, I mean, on average, at the start of the war, uh, they, they could range between 500 to 1,000. It, it just ballpark. Um, the 11th Indiana actually had two different um, recruitment periods. So they had a brief uh, three-month period at the start of the war. Uh, in 1861, because, and it was only three months because they thought the war was going to be really short. Um, and so that group went out, and then many of them re-upped, re-enlisted for a three-year term uh, in 18, 1862. So, um, so yeah, that's the service history. Post-war, uh, many of them were involved in the Grand Army of the Republic, which I mentioned earlier was the uh, veterans fraternal organization um, for the Union Army. Uh, the GAR became among the first organized advocacy groups in American politics, supporting voting rights for black veterans, promoting patriotic education, helping to make Memorial Day a national holiday, um, lobbying Congress to establish regular uh, veterans pensions, and supporting Republican political candidates. So. Um, I mentioned my great 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 grandfather. Um, this is one of the only living, the only artifacts that he walked on this earth that I have. So this was given to him um, in around 1911 uh, by his commanding officer. So um, my great 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 grandfather, George Kennedy, was very involved in the GAR. Um, he did. A number of these things that was that was mentioned. My grandpa used to tell, talk about him stumping for Republican candidates and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, he was very proud of this copy of the Gettysburg Address. This was passed to my great uncle, um, who recited, memorized, and recited the Gettysburg Address to him at, when he was 14 years old. So he passed this on to my great uncle, and then I inherited this from my great uncle when I recited the Gettysburg Address. Uh, when I was 14 years old, so um, so yeah, I, I this is this is something that's very special to me. Uh, it was something that was important to him, and so uh, you know, when we die and pass away, much of our belongings kind of go by the wayside. They go to goodwill, but every so often, maybe one piece of us remains uh, um, among the living. So this is this is George's. So I, I have it. Um, but anyway, so that's the Grand Army of the Republic. A um, little bit about the Indiana GAR. Uh, it started in 1866. Uh, the one that was here in the was called the Pearson Post Number no. 9, was the name of it here. Uh, the highest membership in Indiana was uh, in 1889 and 1890 at 480, 489,000 was the, was the highest membership. Um, the last survivor of the GAR in the state of Indiana was a guy by the name of John Christian Adams, who died on February 17, 1949, uh, in his home in Jonesboro, Indiana, at the age of 101. So that was the last um, Indiana Civil War veteran. For context, the last known Union veteran who died uh, that we know with historical certainty died in 18, or not 18, uh, 1954. 1954, and then the last Confederate one died in 56. Um, so yeah, long, long period, long period of time. That's a picture of Lou Wallace in his, his later years, you see that was. 
<laughs> and so uh, a little bit about the legacy. So some of you may not know this, but uh, Indianapolis's uh, semi-professional soccer team is called the Indy 11, which is named after the 11th Indiana Infantry. Coincidentally enough, um, they just got a big uh, approval for uh, a new soccer stadium uh, in Indianapolis. So, so yeah, the Indy 11 is still, the Montgomery Guards by prox proxy is still being uh, recognized even, even today. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, as I was doing this research, I thought about some potential other avenues for further historical research involving the Montgomery Guards. Um, one thing I thought of was like, how does the Montgomery Guards compare to militia style groups in the US today? So we still have militia groups among us. Uh, some of the most prominent ones are the Proud Boys or Patriot Front. And so my question is what is different about uh, the Montgomery Guards reason for existing versus some of the militia groups of today? Uh, very different reasons for, for existing, but something I was thinking about. Uh, another thing I, I thought about would be that I thought might be an interesting historical project would just be uh, knowing that there were there was free black men that resided here in Montgomery County and who later volunteered in um, um, in, in, in their own units um, later on and so you know what barriers were in place to prevent them from volunteering in the Montgomery Guards or just something to think about for as far as social barriers in the late 1850s. Here, here in Montgomery County. And then just individual stories of, of soldiers. Um, there's a few um, letters that uh, do exist of, of the 11th Indiana that are out there, but it'd be great to find more stories uh, here, here locally. So. Any questions? Yes, mom. <laughs> this is my mother, Darla Morrison. <laughs> Planning her. Huh? Ah, <laughs> uh, I was wanting you to tell who these two were because these are the ancestors of George Canada and Henry Clay Thomas. Yeah. And Henry Clay Thomas fought in the what? Thirty fifth Virginia. He was in the thirty seventh Virginia. Thirty seventh yep. Virginia. Was that called Rocky? I mean, he was a sharpshooter, right? No. Nah. He nah, was. He, he, he was. He was uh, in Stonewall Jackson's uh, unit during. Civil War itself. And so this is his great 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 grandson mm -hmm. and my dad. Or two greats. Two greats. Two greats, yeah. Two I'm three. three. Yeah, he's three. You're three. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So and then this is who? That's my dad, Steve. Steve <laughs> So he uh, so yeah, it's it's three three greats on, on either side. So George Canada on my father's Henry Clay on uh, my mother's side. And George is buried in is it Union Cemetery? In Old Union Cemetery Old Union. in Jamestown. So. And that church is there. I mean, it's, it burnt down, but the fence was built by your great great grandpa. Mm -hmm. That stone fence that's still there. Yep. And that was George Canada's son that built that fence, right? Uh, no, that wasn't his son. That was, that was his great great grandson. Great -grandson. Great -grandson. I get mixed so. up in the generation. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. But anyway. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Montgomery Guards? Right. That's for you. That's the current Indiana 11. Yes. Yeah, there's there, there's a, a group of, uh, of reenactors who continue on the legacy of 11th Indiana. So. Yep. Yes? Now, Wallace, who was acting with these, these Zoolog? Were, were there any other people uh, that did something similar throughout the country, putting, you know, putting their, their units together? Uh, oh yeah, there were all manner of. I mean, zoops. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah zoops were a very popular unit type, so there were Confederate zoops as well as Union zoops. But, but yeah, the the I think the whole uh, the prominence of the zoops uh, in some ways was to bring attention uh, to to bring a sense of uh, panache uh, to um, to the. Uh, um, for the exercise of war. I mean, sure. you, you think about, you know, this is, you know, right before the Civil War, patriotism and a sense of national pride was pretty pretty high. There, there wasn't a sense of uh, the ugliness of war uh, that came later as the casualties mounted. So, 
there was much more of an interest in being uh, being colorful and bring, bringing attention. And it, it's funny as the war uh, wore on, like a lot of these zoobs uniforms, they they just replaced them with their regular um, ones that because it was becoming impractical. And you know, when you're on a battlefield, you might be much rather be hidden than seen. <laughs> you know, you don't you, you don't want this, these big bright red colors uh, drawing attention to yourself when you've got a sharpshooter 500 yards staring your way. So kind of want to blend in. Kind of hard to run in bloomers too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Is there any organizational descendants of the Army of the Republic or Army of the Republic? Yes, so the Sons of Union Veterans is the legacy organization that um, officially has the charter that was that was given by Congress originally to the GAR. So um, there's several camps that still exist here in Indiana. The closest one here to Crawfordsville is actually in, in Indianapolis, uh, the camp that uh, Camp Harrison um, once. So. so yeah, if anybody is a direct descendant of Union Veteran, um, you can apply for, for membership in the Sons of Union Veterans. And so, um, yeah, it's a great group, um, similar to the Daughters of the American Revolution. They, they, they go around and um, on Memorial Day plant flags uh, at cemeteries. They participate in cemetery restoration, historical uh, sharing, all, all those kinds of things. Yes? with Lane. And Wallace, um, if I'm, and that, that's why I'm asking this question. Actually, the first time that Wallace had a chance to go ahead and really understand, be involved with military life, was at the time that they went down for the Mexican War, mm -hmm. and uh, that was his first real thing with the Army and yep. the rules, the regulations, everything of what took place. Am I right or wrong on no, that? No, that's exactly right. I mean, he, he, uh, you know, he, he was first exposed to the idea of the military um, when he was a boy um, and Chief Blackhawk, uh, the, the, the war and the raids were going on just across the Illinois border. And so, you know, as a boy, he's seeing these local militia units start coming together. And so that idea of being in the military was very, very much in his mind from a young age, and he continued that on um, into the Civil War. So, yeah. yes. Do you have names and rosters of the members, or some of them? Some of them, for sure. Um, I, I am not aware of a complete roster of the Montgomery Guards, but there's definitely a full roster of the 11th Indiana. That's and so you could probably piece together who, who was a part of it in, in some sense. So I, I was reading that um, of the 65 that were a part of the Montgomery Guards, all but two uh, ended up in enlisting in the Civil War. So there were apparently two that, that stayed back, but so 63 out of 65 were, were um, also in the Civil War. Hey, Aaron. Yes. Joanne Sprague used to do a lot of research on Montgomery Guard and the other group. Uh, I'll have to look that up, yeah. Yeah, so you'll have to ask her about it. She's still down by Wayne County, I think. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, indulging me uh, in this presentation. So, thank you. <laughs>